Well, for those who don't know me, my name is Kim Atiha. I'm director of the Pennington Public Library. And I am so pleased to welcome you to our talk this evening entitled The Mercer and Somerset Story and the Frog War with railroad historian and author John Kilbride. This event is part of the Hopewell Valley Heritage Week, which celebrates the rich heritage of the Hopewell Valley with events through May 31st, which is very exciting. We've been involved here at the Pennington Public Library with Hopewell Valley Heritage Week for a number of years. And it started off as a weekend and now it's just grown. So that's very exciting to see. If you're curious about the other programs in the Hopewell Valley Heritage Week, please check out the hopewellmuseum.org slash HVHW. And I'm also very pleased that we are co-sponsoring this event with our friends from the Hopewell Valley Historical Society, the Hopewell Museum, and the Hopewell Public Library. As usual, we will be hosting a Q&A afterward. This time it'll be moderated by myself and by Norma Lee from the Hopewell Public Library. So during the program, if you have any questions, please write them into the Q&A section and other comments are of course welcome in the chat window. Let's go through some background about John Kilbride, our speaker. Now retired from a 34 year railroad career at Amtrak, John Kilbride is the moderator of the Camden and Amboy Railroad Historians and the Railroads of Trenton Facebook groups. And he has been studying the CNA since moving to New Jersey in 1979. Kilbride remains interested in historical research and writing on railroad topics, including a just published article on a unique passenger train for a national publication and contributing several photos to a Midwest Railroad themed book. Presently, John Kilbride has started research on a book focusing on the electrification of the Long Island Railroad and another on New Jersey's Camden and Amboy Railroad. He is also involved with the Save the Princeton Dinky Group and advising local historians on specific historic aspects of both the CNA and the Pennsylvania Railroad in New Jersey. A frequent speaker in the tri-state area, Kilbride is able to provide programs on a variety of railroad topics and the CNA up to more contemporary themes. And of course, more importantly, he seeks to travel by train whenever possible. Welcome, John. We are happy to Hi have there. you this evening. Hey, hello, welcome, welcome. And also we have Doug Dixon from the Hopewell Public Library who has your slides. Let's see. You know what? I just realized I forgot to introduce Bob Warsnack. I've never done that before. Oh, Let me do good. that first, actually, if that's okay. Let's include him. And no, you know, I think because Bob lost power earlier. So my brain is on that mode. Like, oh, Bob's not here yet. He lost power. Bob, are you here? I am here. Oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot you, Bob. No, no worries. Bob from the Hopewell Museum, everybody, and the uh, Hopewell Valley Historical Society has a few words for us. Thank you for joining us, Bob. Sure. Thank you, Kim. Uh, and thank you, everyone. I'm Bob Worsnack and I'm the joint program chairperson that creates the programming for the Hopewell Valley Historical Society and the Hopewell Museum. And I serve on both boards. I'm very pleased to be able to partner with our friends at the Pennington Public Library and the Hopewell Public Library on tonight's program. I'm also excited to be partnering with several other organizations this week on the Hopewell Valley Heritage Week program series. We're always thrilled to be able to partner with other local organizations that have an interest in our community's history we're also very happy to be able to continue to share these programs with you virtually and free to the public. We do depend on your generous donations and ask you to consider joining the Hopewell Valley Historical Society as a member or making a donation to either the Historical Society or the Hopewell Museum. Please be sure to visit our websites at hopewellvalleyhistory.org or thehopewellmuseum.org. And I will also put those URLs in a chat window for your convenience. Um, and please visit either site to help you to keep up to date on the monthly programs that we offer or to be able to make a donation to either organization. If you consider joining the Historical Society, you will receive a one-year subscription to our well-researched newsletter. Lastly, be sure to check out all of the remaining 
program offerings for Hopewell Valley Heritage Week. And, that you, and you can find that on the Hopewell Museum's website. Um, you can look for Hopewell Valley Heritage Week and then select HVHW events. Thank you once again for joining and thank you, Kim, for organizing tonight's program. Thank you so much, Bob. And now introducing again, without further ado, John Kilbride. Good evening, uh, let's see. I am appearing throughout the uh, presentation, so I'm, I'm, I'm not using my camera. Uh, it'll probably be distractive, so you'll hear my uh, audio melodic voice uh, throughout. There we go. Wonderful. Oh, there you are. Yep. Okay. Greetings, everyone. Uh, the, the Mercer and Somerset is kind of an interesting uh, entity because it wasn't around very long. And all of my research seems to display, and I'll get into it throughout the next hour or so, that it was built very uh, temporarily by the Camden Amboy Railroad, and the money source was the Pennsylvania Railroad, simply to block uh, this Delaware and Boundbrook Railroad from appearing. And, uh, I'll define some of that stuff as we get into the program. Uh, by all means, um, capture your thoughts and, and we'll talk about it. We'll allow time for the, uh, towards the end here to talk about uh, anything that I've gone over too fast or need to go back and, and uh, talk about. But uh, anyway, so let's take a trip. Um, I did a couple things when I was researching this thing. The first thing I did is I did a ground uh, exploration with a good friend of mine who is now deceased. And the second thing is when we went down to the state archives, uh, the third thing uh, we did was, uh, believe it or not, we chartered an airplane to go aloft and see what we could see uh, from up there. And then we sort of, my, my colleague put together a, a videotape and I wrote the article. So, uh, when, and, and I'll talk about that as we, uh, as we go through here. So, here we go. Okay, this is the infamous picture. Um, I'll go back to it later, but uh, you, will, you will learn that uh, when the railroad was being built, uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad would, would put a, uh, a locomotive where the intended intersection was gonna be to, uh, block the other railroad. And when the Pennsylvania Railroad regular trains came by, which is about every three hours, they would roll the engine out of the way to let the uh, regular passenger train go by. And it was at one of those portions where the, uh, the Delaware and Boundbrook Railroad, the people that were attempting to cross the existing line, put one of their own engines in there to do some blocking. And then rather than give everything away, uh, which I'll cover later on, but here's the infamous uh, picture. The troops were called out uh, and it was a big skirmish and it changed the whole complex of the railroad development in New Jersey because the original charter had said with the railroad of the Camden Amboy Empire that no other railroad could build uh, within 25 miles of its line between New York slash Jersey City and Philadelphia. So I'll get more into that, but keep this image in mind because we will, uh, I'll, I'll dwell on it a little bit later on. There you go. Okay, the name of it. This sign was on Route 206 just north of Princeton until they did the widening of the highway. I do not have it, but that this is the, uh, the whole, the whole, um, background behind the naming of this of this trackage that was built uh, uh, starting in about, uh, ooh, let's see, about early 1870s. And then until the Frog War lasted and, uh, um, you know, everything disappeared. Okay. How did I find out about the railroad? Um, first thing you might remember um, is uh, when we used to have our phone bills, we used to get the little inserts 
and this talked about this is one that was uh, actually it was given to me because I was not in this state when this was issued. But uh, this was the inspiration to uh, dig further about this obscure railroad. And uh, so this was the starting point. Okay. This is a rather complex map and, and uh, I'll, I'll simplify it, but it gives you the whole big picture of all these different railroads that were in this. Here's the Delaware River. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but right in the middle there is the river. And then the Mercer and Somerset became an Amboy Railroad from Trenton northward. And uh, this is where the Frog War was, right in Hopewell. And some of these other railroads that, that developed from it. The uh, Belle Dell Railroad went along the Delaware River through the middle of this map. And that was a subsidiary of the Camden Amboy also. It's a little complex, but I wanted to show you where the Delaware or where the Mercer and Somerset came in to the whole big picture. So it was, it was just not an isolated line. Okay. Real quickly, a chrono. The Camden and Amboy was the first railroad in New Jersey, third in the country. And they were quite clever. They created a monopoly uh, with the railroad and the canal company. And of that monopoly, uh, with, with favor in Trenton, they were able to uh, be taxed uh, for each of the passenger fares and each of the tonnage that was... Uh, carried and so uh some uh 20 37 years later they created the united new jersey railroad and canal company and about this time of course the civil war is now over the uh, camden amboy itself uh could not handle the loads of the civil war so they had to do a reroute and i'll talk about that uh, later on with one of the maps and then we had the two uh, franchises uh, with the foreigners and the Jersey men. Construction began at Somerset Junction, which is right on the Delaware River. Uh, by now, the 1871, the Pennsylvania Railroad was anxious to get into New York City. And so they, Camden Amboy was leased to the Penn for 999 years, which I think is just about over. Not really. Uh, ch charter was awarded to the national company, which is the rivals. The MS was completed January 576 at the Frog War. Um, you'll see later what happened to that. And by three years later, the uh, Mercer and Somerset was sold at auction, the lease terminated, and by 1881, the rails were removed. Okie doke. This is a simplified map to, uh, of uh, Hopewell Township. And you can see I've highlighted in the red line, the uh, Mercer and Somerset Railroad. And this looks like the uh, Delaware and Bambrook and up here they had to cross. And right in there, right in the, up, in the upper, upper right corner there is where the frog war was. Okie doke. And there's a real simplistic map. Uh, you can see up in the upper left where the lines crossed. There was a little clause that they had to cross at 90 degree angles. And that was uh, achieved through some court action. And the, uh, of course, the, uh, the dash line is now gone, but the other one, the hatch lines are still there. The line from Yardley up through Hopewell and Bellmead and on up to Boundbrook is the CSX freight line that's still here. Uh, a little bit further to the east, you can see the uh, Pennsylvania line from Trenton to Princeton Junction and Monmouth Junction and on up to uh, New Brunswick. And the line that was built over to East Millstone, which was uh, would come into some strategic use uh, later on the to in the uh, tail here. Okay, doke. And finally, this is a frog. A frog was uh, uh, is a track piece that allows two lines to cross each other. Inside the gauge, you have some guardrails, 
And um, that was the whole key to the construction. Next. And I want to define it, a non-running rail placed alongside running rails for the purpose of guiding flanges, which are the little edges on wheels across intersecting tracks. Okie doke. And once we started doing our research, um, we used an old fashioned highway map to figure out where the right of way was. And that's the blue line through the, through the center here. And this is actually, I talked about chartering an airplane to go aloft. This is what we actually use to navigate. And I'll talk about that a little bit more with the, uh, when we get to the aloft portion, but you can see the blue line uh, fitting in with highways uh, and uh, not much more than that, but we strictly uh, used it to do our field trips and uh, actually worked out pretty well. Okie doke. Okay, if, like I said, the first thing we did was we spent a couple Sunday or a couple of weekends following what we thought was the old right of way. And this was what was called Somerset Junction on the, uh, both the uh, Delaware and Raritan, or yeah, Delaware and Raritan Canal uh, with the water tank on the Penn line and then went off to the Northeast on Jacobs Creek Road. Uh, which is known as the uh, old windy road that allowed the railroad to climb out of the Delaware Valley. And water tank long gone, but you can see it uh, uh, just having probably watered this uh, Pennsylvania freight train coming down from Phillipsburg area and heading on up towards uh, Trenton. Okie doke. And here's the view pretty much uh, about uh, 10 years ago. Uh, they still have a uh, exercise uh, pav uh, pavilions on this uh, kind of wide area uh, between the Delaware River, which is on the left side and uh, the canal itself, which is on the right side here. Next. And there's the signal, it's gone now, I do not have it but it's a little heavy. I'm wondering how they got it out of there, but it was a, a, a fundamental piece of the Penn Railroad to indicate the junction point. Um, Okie doke. As we go up Jacobs Creek Road to the Northeast, we come across a couple of culverts and this is typical Mercer and Somerset construction. You can see the use of rock. I don't necessarily think it was held in with the uh, concrete, but it might have uh, had some kind of adhesive. And some of these would allow cattle to go from one side of the right of way to the other. And uh, this one is still visible and still very uh, uh, visitative. <clears throat> Next. And another view of the same one. Really uh, interesting. Uh, primitive uh, construction. You can see that the mortar has separated a little bit on the right side there. Okay. A little further up um, past Woolsey Park, we come up to Scotch Road and it's a very visible abutment. That is still there. And uh, you can see how high off the ground it was, about eight foot to keep the railroad level. And uh, there's a very distinct right of way uh, past this, back back towards Woolsey Park. Okie doke. One of our discoveries, we found at least three of the railroad stations. This is the station that used to be at Martin's Corner. Uh, has been moved. It's on private property, so I hate to go very much more specific than that because uh, I don't want to, I want to stay friends with the uh, owners. Very distinct uh, 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 construction. And of course, a little bit modified. One of three. No kidok. As we come into Pennington, uh, you can see the railroad on the left side here. The station is right below Delaware Avenue. Uh, the station is, again is intact, 
Uh, it's been turned 90 degrees, but it was pretty extensive. Right where the, uh, I guess that's Doug's arrow there. That's pretty much where the, uh, the Pennington Library, the other Pennington Library um, is located. And of course, this big north-south road is present day 31. Okie doke. And there it is. Right now it's got a nice red uh, color to it. I'm not clear what's in there now. It's been a little bit of everything over the years. But it's been, like I said, turned 90 degrees from when it was uh, in the active railroad service. Okie doke. And here's what it sort of looked like in the 30s. Again, the railroad was abandoned. Oh, excuse me, that's Hillsboro. Same sort of uh, uh, motif, but uh, it was sort of like cookie color. Um, so, Doug, we've got to move that before the next show. <laughs> next. Okay, this is the old railroad office building right next to uh, Pennington, the Pennington Station. Again, the high second floor, very narrow building. It looks like it's had an addition put on it. And that's uh, still intact. It's a, I believe it's a, uh, I can't quite make out the sign there, but it's uh, an office building now. And I'm standing, or the picture was taken on, uh, on that Delaware Avenue. Okay. And going up further towards um, Branchburg uh, Creek area, another abutment. This one was kind of interesting. It may have been eroded, but you can see that's a whole lot more uh, clearance or a lot less clearance over the creek than the road. But over the years, since the railroad was abandoned, you know, this stuff may have been, uh, you know, just eroded into place. But I don't think there was that much headway when the railroad was there. Okie doke. Another one uh, further down. Uh, this one, nature has sort of recovered from. You would not see much uh, obvious right away in this view. Uh, time is uh, time has changed it pretty significantly. Okie doke. And another side view. And I understand that this is a railroad that had a presence of only about six or seven years. I have no evidence of iron or steel, probably wasn't around yet, but no uh, evidence of iron spans crossing either road or a stream like this. So I suspect that the spans themselves were wood. Again, this was built simply to block the other railroad from getting too much further along. Okie doke. And the historical marker very close to where the uh, um, the Frog War was. Okie doke. And the railroad today has been realigned from where the Frog War was, but it cut across here at about a 45 degree angle. And of course, after the railroad was um, uh, abandoned, you know, the Mercer and Somerset, the uh, railroad came back here and straightened all their right of ways. So this is pretty much what it looks like today. Okie doke. And another, uh, another uh, uh, view of the right of way uh, coming from, you can see a little bit of a stone foundation in the back left there. And this is on the west bank or the west side of the uh, existing uh, right of way, which has basically all been covered over by development. So this is sort of a rare view uh, when I took this about 15 years ago. It has since developed further, but you can see the cut through the trees there to give you an approximate right of way. Okie doke. And I mentioned it had to cross at a 45 degree angle 
so the uh, the existing railroad was the lower of the two, and then the uh, Delaware and Boundbrook came across at the Frog and then became more southerly of the two lines. They sort of paralleled themselves all the way into Hopewell itself. So we took this picture uh, through one of the maps that was uh, available in the state archives. Okay. Another aerial view, uh, you can see right in the middle here, there's a little bit of a bulge uh, that signifies where the railroad came across. Uh, you can, over on the right side here below the railroad, um, the, 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 the right of way is pretty well obliterated. But from this uh, first north-south road, uh, uh, more northerly, you can see the old, very distinct right of way right in the middle of the picture here. Okay. Another view of it, here's, the, uh, here's where the two lines crossed, right below this uh, farm, or right above the farm. Uh, this is a picture probably from about 1920. And I was amazed in the archives, I had aerial photography by then in the archives. This is all in the neighborhood of Van Dyke Road in uh, Hopewell. Okie doke. And a view from Van Dyke Road where the frog crossed and it would be uh, right in the lower part of the lower portion of this picture. At this point I should I'll talk a little bit about the bus trip I took. Uh, I had arranged for the farm owners to visit their property and about a week before the trip, uh, they said that their insurance people had su suggested I not do it. And so uh, I, was, I was anxious to take people to the Frog War site. It's not exactly accessible. So I took the bus that I chartered right down this right of way after I sec attempted to secure railroad permission, would not do it today. Okay, next. Another view of it uh, underneath the uh, Van Dyke Road at this time. Bob and I had talked about doing a fundraising trip. It's still possible we could walk in from this side because the farm itself is now abandoned. But uh, we'll, we'll talk it over and see if it's practical down the road a ways. Okie doke. Another view. Best time to do any photography out in the field like this is in uh, the trees or, or the uh, leaves are off the trees. So the right of way was right between those two bigger portions of these uh, trees here. Next. And a close up. Just to the uh, right of the one. Um, evergreen tree uh, where the trail sort of wanders back into. Okie doke. And closer to Hopewell, here's another culvert. You can see the very uh, rough construction, but it did the trick. It's still there right on uh, that Model Avenue, which was the right of way through Hopewell. Okie doke. And the, the uh, picture from the Hopewell book of the railroad, the, you can see the railroad station was like actually right between the two railroads. Uh, Delaware and Boundbrook is still there. That's the present day freight line through Hopewell. And they called this the Summer, Somerset branch of the Belvedere. It had a couple titles. Next. And there's the uh, station itself in uh, Hopewell on Model Avenue. What I have not yet figured out is whether the railroad right of way may have been either right here on Model Avenue or behind this building, but it was right there. There's a swath that gives away uh, some right of way in the back side of it. So that, uh, you know, every time I went out in the field, I came back with more questions than answers. Uh, next, and about 10 years ago, uh, 
Hunterton County started with the uh, historical marker program. This one is explains everything and uh, right at the uh, Pennington or yeah, Hopewell station. Okie doke. And I talked about the two railroads paralleling each other north out of Hopewell. The tree line in the background is the old Mercer and Somerset. And the, the existing freight line, the ex-Delaware and Boundbrook is in the foreground here. And that's, like I said, still active. Okie doke. And once you get down below Skillman, or below Hopewell towards Skillman, the right of way is very, very visible, at least on this end of the railroad. As you get up past Harlingen, it disappears with all the modern development. But it is a definitely a distinct right of way uh, embankment, about eight foot in above the ground. So I keep on wondering if those trees could talk. Next. Another view, um, a couple, couple of miles away. This is all in the Skillman area now. Okie doke. Get a little bit closer. The embankment was significant. I estimated this one was about uh, six to eight foot in the, in the air. Okie doke. And another uh, embankment and the uh, culvert. I went back in this area about 10 years ago and I could not find this. There has been um, a lot of development in this area and all it takes is, uh, you know, a, a living complex in some places to uh, wipe out any examples of the right of way due to erosion or rainfall or other development. So uh, we may we may want to have to look for this again. Okie doke. Again, you can see the rough um, uh, construction methods that were used. And this again, either to allow a brook to go through here, which is, it was wet um, the first time I found this. And um, the other thing is sometimes the, the railroad went right through a farmer's pasture. So this is a way his cattle could go from one side of the tracks to the other. Okie doke. And the same uh, view from back a little ways. Or maybe it's probably the other side because there was a tree uh, blocking some of the egress to the thing. Okie doke. Again, a little further south, uh, further north, as we're heading up towards uh, Hillsboro. Okie doke. You can start to see in the back that the uh, the land was either cultivated or was ex pastures and the right of way is like just totally has disappeared. Next. This is a uh, view of Harlingen. And the railroad went across about two thirds of the way up. Um, I showed this to some Harlingen folks about a year ago and they they couldn't make out well, a compass direction here. Next. But we did find what we thought was a station. Uh, converted now right off of 206. I'll explain it in the aerial, but I'll mention it here. Uh, this is the first place I realized that the right of way was protected by Osage orange bushes. And the Osage orange um, plantings or what have you had thorns. So it kept cattle off the tracks. So it was kind of an interesting uh, use of uh, nature to act as a barricade or uh, like I said, keep cattle off the tracks. And this is just a shy of where the railroad crossed present day Route 206. Okie doke. 
this got to be an interesting place. This was further north uh, on the right of way. Uh, I believe it was called uh, Medford Court. And the railroad went right ahead of where we parked our van. And again, we could see it with these Osage orange bushes it formed uh, two distinct parallel lines to uh, got out the uh, you know keep out keep out the uh, keep the livestock off the tracks. Okie doke. Some more uh, abutment. Um, this might even include some Osage oranges, or bushes. Okie doke. This definitely had some. They're over on the left side there. Those are Osage oranges. And they're, you know, I think there's a couple on that. Big, uh, somebody says they described them as an orange looking brain, a lot of wrinkled matter. Okie doke. And up at Millstone, uh, abutment still in the Millstone Creek. Um, there was a, a span here at one point because when they talk about uh, reacting to the uh, barricade, uh, they called out a locomotive from um, from Millstone itself and it would have gone across the span. Even the timetable talks about trains passing through here on about a three minute passage. So that would be awful tough for people to walk around get off a train, walk around, and get back on a train in three minutes. So that is still there in the middle of the Millstone Creek. Next. And a close-up of it. Okie doke. Okay. The Frog War itself. Um, I've got a little bit of a narrative here, so we're going to stick onto this uh, slide for just a few seconds longer. Um, like I said, the uh, Pen Pennsylvania Railroad had a protect engine that they used to park where this grade crossing or, or frog crossing was going to come. And uh, they would move it out of the way when their passenger train moved. But at one point, uh, the railroad being construction gang showed up with uh, another engine and blocked the Pennsylvania engine from going back to protect the crossing. So here's a narrative from uh, 1916. Uh, the first thing we know, the Pennsylvania had its biggest engine, numbered 679. I can still see the figures on her now after 40 years. Standing on its track just where the D and BB was to cross it, and it was evident to the various Tyro that they meant to contest the crossing, but the D&B men under Squire Knight were equal to the occasion. Three months ran along and the Boundbrook was about to lay its rails across the rival road. The Pensy was a single track and every time a train came along, which wasn't often, the guarding engine had to move off onto a siding and let the regular go by immediately after which it would resume its position. Then came a bitter cold Wednesday night, January the 5th it was at 7.30 p.m. when the regular train was due. The guard engine went into the siding as it had done for three months before when suddenly and silently, an army of 200 stout employees of the DB rose from ambush nearby, rushed upon the guard engine, barricaded the tracks before and behind it with ties and other timber and proceeded to tie their captive with heavy chain to the track. Then they barricaded the main track above and below the crossing in a similar manner, tore up the rails and ties and proceeded to lay their heavy frogs for the crossing. News of the incident was of course sent at once to Superintendent Jackson of the Pensy at Jersey City. And after he blown off steam for a minute as men will do on occasion, I resemble that remark. He wired to engineer George Ellis at Millstone to get out number 336 and to put all steam and to ram their barricade at full speed and scatter it to the devil. I know because Ellis later showed me the telegram and number 336 was one of their largest engines. Ellis proud, 
proved to be a man of, for the emergency. It's 11 miles from Millstone to Hopewell, and he made it in 13 minutes. Well, around the scene of operations, a crowd of 500 had gathered by this time, heard a dull roar rumbling down the valley towards Millstone that increased to a roar, and then a fiery thing vomiting smoke and flame dashed into view and made for the crossing. Not one of us thought that she would take the barricade and we made no effort to get out of the way, but take it she did and at full speed. I never saw such a scene in my life. First, there was a crash and then ties, rails, timber, tools, lanterns, and whatnot went flying in all directions like skyrockets on a 4th of July night. The wonder was there, there wasn't a dozen killed, but nobody was hurt, at least so as not to require attention. Even Ellis escaped with slight bruises while number 336 sinking into the soft earth, soft earth was put to rights in the repair shop in a day. The other engines were sent down by the pensive people to hold the fort, but the Boundbrook officials were ready for them and seized and held all three while an engine of their own was placed on the completed tie. News of what was going on had spread meanwhile throughout the countryside and by morning nearly 1500 people had gathered many of them armed especially the farmers were squirrel rifles smooth bore muskets and some of the old king's arms flintlocks of the revolution public feeling against the pensy was high as i had said and many threats were uttered against the officials thereof council of the pensy arrived from newark on the 6th at 11 o'clock with an injunction constraining the Delaware and Boundbrook from meddling with the Pensy's property until a chancellor could hear and decide the case. This added fuel to the flames and such was the tension that at 1 p.m. Sheriff Mont telegraphed Governor Beadle for troops. Four of the Trenton companies, A, B, D, and G, were at once ordered under arms, the alarm to rally being sounded by the city Hall Bell and one company from Lambertville, the whole under the command of Colonel Argel of the 7th Regiment. The troops arrived on the scene shortly after six the next morning while it was still dark and soon their campfires lit the skies while groups gathered around them and proceeded with the morning meal. The three engines and armies of employees and spectators form, formed a somber background. Armed guards were quickly placed around the scene of the combat and the excitement to the great extent had subsided. Then at one o'clock on the same day, news came that the chancellor decided that the Delaware and Boundbrook could cross the pen line and thus ended the Battle of the Frogs. So that's the, that's the whole story on that whole thing. Um, I might recommend um, you look this up in Garden State Legacy Magazine, which is the article that I wrote. And uh, there's a whole description and diagrams and, and a copy of the words that I just wrote. I want to point out at the bottom here, we should, it, it, the original law that the state passed in 1832, it shall, not, it shall not be lawful at any time during the charter of the CNA to construct any other railroad in the state without consent of, of the companies which is the United Companies. Um, can we get rid of this? Uh... Yeah, thank you. Uh, so shall be intended or used for the transportation of passengers or messengers uh, uh, between the uh, cities of New York and Philadelphia. Um, so that was that was the law that the Mercer and Somerset and Canada and Amboy were following. Okay, Doug, we're next. Now there it is. It's uh, that was the whole law that the uh, railroad was using to all uh, to justify what they did. Next. And that's what the frog looked like when it was in place. Um, I have fig pretty well figured out that this uh, line going from lower right to upper left is the pen line because it's got telegraph poles already. I don't know if I'm looking north or looking south, but anyway, uh, that was the completed frog. 
and that was uh, taken shortly after the battle of itself. Battle is a, uh, I don't know, a, a uh, weird word to use. Next. And here's an aerial shot again of the eventual alignment. Uh, again, an aerial shot with the, uh, with the topography. You can see this little loop uh, down at the bottom here, just above this little hex. And that was the Mercer and Somerset originally, the, the alignment. Next. And again, this is a uh, copy of, of that which I shared earlier, except it's just a raw uh, negative map. And just notice they have even the uh, compass headings for all this uh, survey work that was created. And here's the, the uh, Mercer and Somerset up top and then it crosses and uh, takes the, uh, the southernmost route between the two and heading towards Blomberg itself. Okay, next. So I talked about uh, one of our points, we decided to go aloft and see what we could find. So uh, that's what we did. Uh, looking for this whole thing, everyone, uh, uh, 111 years after rails were removed. Okie doke, next. There is the official Mercer and Somerset exploration plane. It was a the pilot was a Princeton student from Denmark or Den, uh, Denmark or, or uh, Netherlands I can't remember which but he couldn't figure out why these two wackos wanted to go take a excursion flight up and down and we did a couple loop the loops and back arounds and I think we had it charted for two two hours next and this is another map that we took along with us that we by this time we had pretty well figured out where the right of way was. So there's three of them here, next. And this is putting the Mercer and Somerset Railroad on top of a, a present day geodetic map. We were able to even uh, indicate one of these things with all the mile markers. And we lucked out and we found some. So I'll show you those shortly too, next. And here's the uh, top north view. Uh, as it heads towards East Millstone. And this is the toughest one to, uh, to find. Um, and, uh, you know, this is the end. It's, it sort of has disappeared under modern day uh, construction and uh, living quarters and uh, housing developments and, that, and the like. Next. Okay, here we are aloft. Uh, this is in the uh, uh, Marshall's Corner area. The right of way is right across the uh, middle here above this big factory. And this is uh, south of Hopewell. Next. And let me see, this is, uh, yeah, here's the uh, up in the lower uh, right here up towards the uh, towards it goes to the uh, east of that lake. That's the road into Hopewell. Uh, and we're basically above Route 31, uh, looking north. And you can see the right of way uh, right up here. Right up in this, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but it's up here. Okay, next. And let's see, there is Model Avenue across the middle. Here's the existing uh, CSX track, and here's the building right here between these two red objects, uh, the model railroad uh, station. Like I said, there's enough enough suspicion you don't know whether the right of way was actually on Model Avenue or when it got to the station area, it might have been in the backyard there. Worthy of another look see. Next. Uh, a little bit blurred. Uh, the right of way is right alongside this line up through the top here, the uh, middle, middle through the portion. Next. 
And again, uh, let's see, here's the railroad right away, right across the middle here with the two, uh, the two lines basically paralleling each other about a block apart. Next. This is over the Frog War site. And the Frog War would have been in the lower right corner here. Again, there was a little bit of a loop and uh, it came back closer uh, once it made the crossing. I'm gonna emphasize again, uh, the uh, Mercer and Somerset um, was, well, both of these were realigned. Um, and of course you can see the present right away uh, uh, of, the, of the existing freight line. Next. Again, you can see the bulge of the right of way, uh, right above, uh, you know, about an inch in from the picture on the lower right. And the Frog Wars farm was up here in the upper right corner. And that's where I had hoped to get into uh, with my bus trip, but uh, did not prevail. So we got in the other way. Next. Again, another view of the uh, Frog War site. You can see the bulge in the uh, right side here of where the uh, original Mercer and Somerset was. Next. And this is on the west side of the right of way. Uh, the frog was up at the top point here, but you can see everything to the south uh, below that swath of tree there has been uh, developed. And so the right of way is you just, you just can't find it anymore. Next. And another distinctive uh, in the tree line here. <clears throat> Which where the right of way was. Okay. Next, yep. This uh, looks, yeah, right in the center here um, is the uh, Hopewell Station. Again, right in the right distinctly in the middle. And you can see the swath of railroad that was uh, still the present day is there. Next. Uh, the thin tree line going from right center to left center was the right of way. This is up more towards uh, Skillman. Very distinct. Next. This is up towards the Beekman property. Uh, you can see Route 206 coming in about halfway up on the right side. And the railroad right away was in this tree line on again the right for you know right from center. And this is up at uh, pretty much close to Harlingen. And this is where I first discovered all of these uh, um, really uh, uh, where the Osage Orange was. And again, up at the, uh, close to the Beekman Estate, right in the foreground, as well as wooded areas and Route 206 coming in from the upper, from the upper uh, right. Next. Again, another one. We wanted to, uh, we wanted, to, we went around here a couple times because this was sort of significant. Is where the railroad was actually crossing Route 206. And next, the railroad right away is this wooded area, coming from upper left to lower right. Oh, it's looking back at the Beekman Estate. That's what it is. Next. And remember I talked about Mont Montford uh, Court. This is where we had parked that van right down in here in the lower left. And that was X right away. You can basically just make out um, limited access where these clumps of trees are. And uh, this is all now, I was over there uh, about a year ago and this is all housing now. 
So this right away, which is distinctive from the uh, center right towards the lower left. And you can see the uh, cul-de-sac there just into the next batch of trees. That was the right away. Next, same view with the cul-de-sac. And again, looking at the, you can see the distinct tree line. You know, they probably got houses in here and these folks don't have any idea what was in their backyard and, you know, up until about the 1980s. Next. Okay, one of the nice little gems that we've discovered is these mile markers. Uh, mile marker seven, I will tell you, was very close to Route 31 uh, near that uh, petting zoo uh, before the road went off to... Uh, Hope well, hope well. And we hope to recover this and relocate it in a more public spot. And I'll yield to the Hopewell Valley historical guys to come through on that. Uh, it's interesting because this was first photographed in about the 1980s on the high embankment. The embankment has been washed away by a close stream and this mile, this mile marker carved about, uh, I would say about six foot long, of which about five foot of it were in the ground has now tumbled down into this stream. So we hope to recover it and put it someplace in public view where people can see it. Next. Uh, let's see, this is mile post 13. And you notice how the tree has now grown around it. And uh, there was only about a foot of it visible. So this is the second one that we found. I think we found a total of four. Next. A little bit of a close up. We had to clear away some soil and uh, to get this, uh, to get 13 a little bit visible. Next. A typical MS rail that was uh, discovered by my deceased partner, and uh, he never told me where it was. I believe it was in Hopewell somewhere. Somebody had it in their collection. But he was able to get it out into the sun and photograph it. Next. I'm looking at the Moody's um, book of uh, financial statistics for the railroad. I never found any uh, Mercer and Somerset locomotives or passenger cars and notice in the rolling stock it says furnished by leasees. The uh, state archives does have some financial records. It seemed like all the monies went from the Mercer and Somerset Railroad to the PRR. There was no monies shown in the books as going back the other way. So who provided the paint for the stations? We can only uh, guess. Uh, notice the directors, Ashbel Welsh was a CNA man, uh, George B. Robert and Scott were both former presidents of the railroad uh, through the PRR. I saw in my research the name Van Zant in a couple of different places from Blauenberg. And of course, Ishbel was the president, but uh, next. This is 1876, so it would have been, uh, uh, let's see, ba -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. a couple of years after the Frog War itself. Here's the Mercer and Somerset timetable. You could be in New York in about two and a half hours. And you would change trains, I believe, in New Brunswick. But you can see on the lower section here some of the uh, spots that I've, I've talked about. Uh, it didn't last much longer because the railroad disappeared abound uh, in the 1880s. Next. I've got some references here. Uh, probably easier to get a hold of me if any of these uh, are something you want to follow up on. Um, the, I would recommend, uh, let me, uh, next please. Henry Carlton Beck's book, The Roads from Home, is a great chapter on the MS. 
And uh, last I looked, it was in the Hopewell Valley Library or um, at Mercer County Library. I know it's got a couple copies of it. So highly recommended. Next. I did a couple of articles. Uh, one of them was uh, for the Camden Amboy Railroad Group. Uh, wow, it's 2011, 10 years old already. Uh, this is readily available if you need, we would like to get a copy. I can provide that for you. Also, I can scan it. Next. Every now and then we do these trips. And uh, one of these times I went down to this historical marker and I found these 19, uh, what was it, Bob, about 2000. We had the, uh, the 2000 hobos that were following this obscure railroad. Uh, with these, these markers had just been put up and they're on uh, um, the uh, right away Jacobs Creek Road where uh, Hightown Pennington 2016 wow so you might recognize some uh, hobos there next I uh, thank you for your time and uh, uh, I don't think there's a, there may be another one, but uh, I'm ready to take questions or, uh, ah, yep, that was the last one. Okay. Thank you so much, John. Mm -hmm. It was so neat to travel through your footsteps as you discover the right of way. We do have a question from Linda. Linda is wondering why are most of these right of way still intact if the railroads are not running anymore? Um, I think, it, you know, basically a, a, a layman's way to answer that is the, the property reverted back to the property owners before the railroad was built. And depending on um, its location and its, uh, you know, uh, um, location for development, I mean, you know, some, some stuff out in the middle there is not, is not yet developed. And like I said, it's, you know, 100 and uh, 20 some odd years since the railroad was last there. So if the property owners are going to sell it to a developer, that's one thing. If it's just not worth it, anything, you know, it's farmland. Um, it's not really strategic, uh, this or that, whatever. Uh, it's just staying where it is. And I've noticed uh, from Hillsborough on up north, more of the railroad right away is disappearing every day. Wow. Is there any preservation of it that occurring any, any preservation yes nothing formal okay speaking of the right-of-way um in the chat sarah was asking um most of it appears to be raised she was wondering if that was raised because they wanted to keep the train at the same level and above the um flood line is that correct level yeah yeah basically the level right away mm. yep we also have a question from uh, from fitz um i who wonders how many people were injured at the, the collision at the crossing. Uh, you seem to mention in the article that it was little injury, but that seems quite astounding. Yeah, well, uh, you know, injuries in those, in those days were probably treated a little bit differently than, than what we're used to. I mean, there was no FEMA or uh, any of that kind of stuff. So, the, you know, the railroad would probably got bruised and battered and bounced around when he hit that barricade. But you know, they, uh, they, it was a little different days and, you know, he was proud to go back to work and showing no ill effect from this probably a uh, pretty uh, massive uh, collision. Yeah, Much that's... tougher, huh? Much tougher <laughs> back then, right, Norm? <laughs> that's remarkable. I mean, as we, as we used to say in the railroad, you got to be tough, ma'am. Because mm. it sounds like what if he made it 11 miles in 13 minutes? He was going almost 60 miles an hour, it sounds yeah. like. Hit that yeah. barricade. That's amazing. Yeah. That's very remarkable. There's, there seems to be um, the people who joined in, the 1,500 people. Um, you mentioned that the Pensy line wasn't very popular. Could you give some background about, I guess, their unpopularity? Well, I think, like I said, this railroad was basically built. I mean, the, the uh, Mercer and Somerset was built, but I, I suspect it was built on the cheap. 
you know, they didn't have substantial biz. They didn't have substantial um, bridges. Uh, you know, it was wood, and you could dispose of wood. You could reuse wood after the uh, the life of this thing. And somebody may have had a an inkling that you know this was not going to stand um, the test of the courts. You know that that 1832 law was now 50 years old. They could see it was going to impede. Uh, the right of way construction between these growing uh, metropolitan ports of New York and Philadelphia to the fact that you might even have been impeding commerce. And it was to Jersey's advantage to get other routes built so that they could share in this, uh, you know, it, it was actually a strategic market between those two, those two big cities. Uh, the Camden and Amboy was founded in 1832, or chartered is a better word, and by you know the 1870s, all the original charter holders were dead, and uh, the Penn wanted to get into New York, and uh, you know their easiest way of doing it was to just buy the CNA rather than build their old railroad line, and you know by then the the Reading wanted to get into. I think it was last time I counted, there was about five railroads serving those two city pairs when all was said and done. And, uh, you know, the, the, the incorporators of the uh, CNA were no longer around to uh, make the sweetheart deals with Trenton. I'm trying to be kind here because I don't, there may be some politicians in the audience that I don't want to uh, offend the wrong way. I used to say with the Camden and Amboy, they spent more money lobbying Trenton than safety uh, features on their railroad line. I suspect the same was true for the Mercer and Somerset. Okay. John, are you aware of any other notable U.S. train frog wars of the past or any legal outcomes of those? I don't think, I think it happened. I don't think they've been as well documented. And I choose to fo just focus on the New Jersey uh, events. Um, certainly up North Jersey, there was other frog war skirmishes that, uh, you know, by then the, the courts had made the decision and, uh, you know, there was no longer a supreme right away to anybody. Uh, you know, you, you, had to, you had to list your charter very specifically. And if you knew you're going to have to cross XYZ Railroad and maybe run alongside ABC, you know, you took that into account when you uh, filed your charter. But probably nothing is spectacular. So... If the Hopewell um, frog war was so spectacular, do you think it was instrumental in changing those laws? So oh, yeah. They didn't have those yeah. supreme right of ways? Yeah, as I alluded to, and I, I hope I made it clear that uh, when, the, when the skirmish happened and they, they submitted it to the courts, the courts decided that that 1823 law that was on the books was no longer enforceable. Mm -hmm. So, um, Norm, if you wanted to build a railroad and you had to cross mine, you know, I'd probably welcome you something short of with open arms or we figure out how we can, <laughs> how we can work together. Uh, I, you know, I think we, we, there's enough people around that have a specific interest in a specific railroad like the Pennsylvania Railroad. But the Pennsylvania Railroad wouldn't have existed in Jersey if they hadn't exchanged business with some of the other railroads in New Jersey. And so it was one hand washes the other, uh, especially nowadays, you know one relies on the other for the interchange of traffic. Passengers, passenger situation is a different story. I mean, you have to live with New Jersey Transit and that's it. Very fascinating. Uh, ben has a question. Was the railroad graded to the Delaware River? Was it graded? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's where it interchanged with the existing Pennsylvania Railroad line that came up out of Trenton. And it was in that uh, 1876 timetable that I showed that there was service from New York to Trenton via the Mercer and Somerset. So you could go down to the Hopewell station and ride a train either to New York or to Trenton. And that was probably direct. If you wanted to go further, like to Washington or Philadelphia, you would have had to change trains. But at least the basics uh, line uh, left the Delaware River basin and climbed up present day Jacobs Creek Road. And that's a that's a hill there. You know, if you've ever driven it, you don't have to put your car in lower gear, but uh, it's a constant climb till you get up to about uh, Pennington uh, Washington Crossing Road. Right. So yeah, it was, it, 
it was level, but it wasn't. It was a, it was a hill climb. All right. Maybe Norm, you know something about this too. Um, our car has a question. Is there anything in Hopewell that symbolizes the frog war? Hmm. Um, I should defer that to either Bob or Doug. They're uh, Hopewell. They're Hopewell. Uh, they're Hopewell family. Yeah, the frog is sort of the uh, informal symbol of Hopewell. So <laughs> the elementary school uses it. There's a frog on the top of the gazebo, for example. And there's uh, other instances of frogs and frogs hidden around town and frogs used with the harvest fair and that kind of thing. Well, that's good so to know. Anybody, anybody, and I'll, I'll leave this to maybe Bob to, uh, you know, to collect interested persons so we could do a, we could do a carpooling visit sometime uh, before the leaves come back and, uh, you know, depending on how we do it. We did, uh, I've done at least two of them and, uh, you know, we could knock it off in about four or five hours. Someone would probably have to buy me a Coke halfway through. <laughs> that sounds fun. Annie has a question. Uh, when we say, in quotes, the frog war, are we talking about the one altercation on January 5th or a lengthy legal competitive battle between the railroads? Uh, the big, of course, was the frog war itself. And, I, and like you say, um, well, like I've said, um, um, you know, was that one incident where all of a sudden, you know, you had your sympathizers for the one railroad, you had your sympathizers for the other railroad. This is like, uh, what, 100 years after the Revolutionary War and only 20 years since the Civil War. So you probably had a lot of... Uh, uh, soldier warrior types that are, you know, anxious to practice their shooting skills all over again, and uh, probably form their loyalties as soon as the uh, the two locomotives collided. And uh, so, you know, you ladies in the audience know how you can get us all fired up over little things. And so, uh, you know, they probably quickly draw sides and and uh, facing each other with these musket you know, one shot and you got to reload type things. And, uh, uh, you know, you quickly pick, you, you, you pick your warriors or you pick your enemies real quick. And so uh, you know, the, the, the call in the National Guard to tell everybody to go home was probably the, that was, that was the peak. I mean, after that, there was no, you know, a kick to the courts and the courts made decision and, and all right, boys, go home and uh, we'll live in peace now. And the other guys can build their railroad. And uh, like I said, that the fact that the Mercer and Somerset disappeared, you know, within five or six years afterwards, uh, you know, that was it. That was it. And why did it disappear? Do we know? Uh, it was not exactly an express trip. Um, the other railroad, the one that re the, the one that remained, Delaware and Bambrook could serve the endpoints, uh, well, not the, at the north end anyway, could get you down into the area a little bit quicker. You know, it, it's that's the line that currently stops at Bellmead, um, Hopewell, um, um, Pennington is gone now. The station building is still there, so it was just more convenient. It was more direct, and probably quicker service. You mentioned for the Delaware and Boundbrook, you mentioned these men as, in quotes, foreigners. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, the railroad, the Delaware and Boundbrook was initially incorporated in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And they chartered to build from, I think it might have been Newtown, across the Delaware River into New Jersey. And then, of course, that would require a whole other court filing. But you know, the, the uh, Pennsylvania Railroad, the Camden Amboy Railroad, they'd all been around for at least a couple of generations, you know, since 1832. And so they had the favor in Trenton. And so that's why I delineated between the two. Uh, um, and let's face it, Trenton hasn't changed. Money talks and, you know, whatever you want, we'll give it to you. And you may have to, uh, you know, give us a, a certain percentage of uh, freight hauled or passenger ticket 
pricing and stuff like that. But you know, Trenton can Trenton can get with the program fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. Did I say, did I say that? I'm talking about 1870s now, folks, not 19 or 20, 2000. Sherry has a question. Uh, she mentioned, she said you mentioned that it was a stout, stout company men who ran out of the woods during the altercation. Is she correct? I don't even remember if you said that. Was it a stout company? The South Company? Stout Company. S-O-U-T-H? S-T-O-U-T. T. Oh, stout. It's probably just describing their, you know, physical characteristics. That's right. Yes. You know? <laughs> you know, these, these people are probably, most of them worked in the fields. And, yeah. Uh, you know, horseshoeing and all that kind of stuff. The Hillsboro Station, which I alluded to there, was just out of place. That became a blacksmith shop. So these are probably the majority of men who worked the fields. Okay. And, you know, you work up your physical uh, uh, stature and, and uh, you know, it wasn't a desk job like we're used to nowadays. So that's probably what they were alluding to. Yes. That's why the injuries were minimal. <laughs> yeah. They were, they, were, they were hardy guys and, uh, you know, I don't think they partied high, partied <laughs> high, but they would, uh, you know, they would go to bed at night tired from all the toils out in the fields. James has a question. It seems um, like they were motivated. Yes, Norm? No, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, James has a question. Uh, where was or is milepost 13? I am not telling. Okay. Because the next thing you know, how many people do we have signed in here, 66? <laughs> there would be 65 people. I don't need to because I know where it is. There'll be 65 people looking for it tomorrow. And, uh, you know, seriously, uh, um, if you want to if you want to go back and take screenshots of that three page map I have and then figure out 520, 5,280 feet from the river and go, you know, a mile all the way up towards Millstone, you'd probably come within 200 yards of it. But I'm not telling. And it's only to protect the landowners. When the river disappeared, all this stuff reverted back to the landowners. And uh, we, we know there's a couple physical characteristics that I'm going to talk about, but I'm, you know, they're on private property and we want to respect that. Um, Thank you for clarifying, John. Yeah, some of, the, some of it's been shared with me, uh, but I don't feel uh, appropriate to, uh, you know, lead a tour to it. Uh, the milepost that we talked about, you know, hopefully we'll get that relocated. You can go up and touch it. You can see how it's rough hewn uh, when it was uh, when it was uh, created. It has milepost seven or the numbers one through, I think the highest one would have been 61 or something. And it's got that chiseled on both sides of this triangular stone. So sooner or later, um, I tell you what, when the work party starts to get this thing moved and it's a, it's a considerable location from the main drag and there's a couple of hills involved. So when we get ready to do that, uh, maybe we'll put the word out that we're looking for some hardy souls on a day and come out and join us. And uh, maybe we'll share a, a Coke or something on the old right of way. But uh, it's just, it's just to protect property owners. Thank you. Do we know if there's anything left of the engines themselves? No. Uh, Norm, like I talked about, the, the Mercer and Somerset had no rolling stock amongst themselves. They borrowed stuff from the, probably the PRR. Uh, and, you know, when the railroad disappeared, all that stuff wound up running on other routes until its, uh, until its life was uh, deemed, um, you know, appropriate to scrap. Um, you know, this is short, shortly before metal cars, steel cars were built. And, um, you know, the, the, the railroad marched on through modernization. You know, by 1930, they were running trains with electricity. So um, um, I'm, I'm gonna guess it, unless, it was funny, we did the right-of-way trip uh, in 2016 that Bob reported. And while we we're out there, 
somebody reported if we had seen the uh, passenger car in the woods. And of course, I was ready to dump all these people and go out looking for this thing, except the sun was going down. But I went back within a couple of days and it was a piggyback tractor trailer that somebody thought was a passionate car in the woods. So it was a false, but we had to explore it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's a long-winded way of uh, answering a question, I think. But no, I don't think there's much left anymore. It's a shame. Yeah, it is a shame. Do you know, uh, the, Ben has uh, a question. The, the, excuse me a sec. The farmhouse on the Beekman property, which the state now has, it's about where the railroad crossed Route 206 in Harlingen. I'm told that there are some spikes in a shed on that property. And I've really not been motivated to look for them, you know, but it, that may be something else that somebody else may want to take on and, and I can help you with that. Okay. Didn't mean to interrupt. It's all right. People are very curious. So we have some questions still rolling in. Um, ben has a question. Was there any intent to continue the MS westward across the Delaware to connect with Philly, Newtown, and New York? It was originally intended to become, uh, it was a pen line, I think, is now the one that goes stops at Newtown. Uh, one of the maps that I showed had a dashed line that uh, it was intended to go further. But, um, you know, once they lost the Jersey segment of it through court action, uh, there was no reason to continue that. Okay. And Bill is wondering where were the locomotive facilities located and where was the starting point of the railroad? <coughs> mm, excuse me. I know there was an engine house in East Millstone, but when you run through trains like that, you know, all the way over to present day Jersey Avenue or present day Trenton, that these locomotives could have been um, serviced at uh, Morrisville shops or the East Millstone shops. Typical railroad, um, just because you see a locomotive on this particular section of the line, it doesn't spend its whole his, its whole life there. Uh, presently, locomotives have to be inspected every 92 days, including the cars on the Princeton Dinky. So once they're on there, yeah, they may show back up later, but it won't be right away, and they're not um, permanently assigned to that branch. So the fact that these um, rolling stock for the uh, Mercer and Somerset was being supplied by the Penn Railroad. It may have showed up there once or twice a year. Okay. I think we have one more question I'm gonna wrap up with, um, which someone is curious about, you mentioned a colleague of yours and they were wondering if this colleague uh, was John Warwick. Yes, indeed. Okay. John uh, produced the DVD or a VHS rather and uh, there was talk about trying to make that available to anybody that was interested. I have a copy of it. Uh, I don't think there's any copyright laws at this point that we need to worry about, but if there's interest, um, why don't they feel their um, interest towards Bob and we can chew on it and uh, you know see if it might be a dandy uh, fundraiser for one of the four uh, host organizations here. Sure, if you have any questions, further questions for John Kilbride, you could also direct them to the Pennington Public Library and we will forward them to you, John. So this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to have you here too, Norm. Uh, Norm is for the Hopewell Public Library and Indeed. has also volunteered for the Pennington Public Library before. Indeed. And Indeed. so this is very fun collaboration. So thank you so much. Um, thank you to Doug Dixon for being our slide master. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. If we were in person, I'd ask for a show of hands. <laughs> Doug, I couldn't have done it. Bob's uh, tutelage also was uh, instrumental in, in producing this. And so uh, I think there was talk about recording. So uh, uh, was there a YouTube? Did you talk about a YouTube channel that uh, we can do uh, some, you know, some follow up at some point? Yes, this is being recorded right now. Um, the Pennington Public Library does have a YouTube channel. Uh, we don't release recordings normally until 
probably a month or two after the program, but this will be definitely on our docket to edit and post. Um, I would also like to, to thank uh, Kat Hogan, um, who is instrumental to putting together this whole Heritage Week, which has been amazing, has grown so much. So uh, shout out to Kat and uh, thank you to everyone. Um, Norma, is there anything you wanted to mention that the Hopewell Public Library has upcoming? Sure, yeah. So um, I represent the Hopewell Library, 13 East Broad Street in Hopewell Borough. And we've got a couple of programs coming up. Um, one of them is a local history program, kind of similar to this one. It's about how the growth of railroads in the 1870s um, helped spur the creation of an industrial district in Hopewell. Um, and that's on June 10th. We also have a garden tour. Some of the hidden horticultural gems in Hopewell um, have agreed to open their doors to us and our patrons. Um, that's on June 26th, if you want to check that out. Um, you can get more information on our website, www.redlibrary.org, or just check us out on Facebook and Instagram. So, yeah. Oh, that's great. It's fun. That sounds wonderful. Yeah, indeed. We're yeah, very that's... excited. Yeah, the Pennington Library, we're in the process of moving back into our building after over eight months of construction right now. <laughs> but we will be having virtual programs weekly or twice a week through the end of June. Um, we may slow down a little bit in July to take a breath, but you can check out our calendar of events at PenningtonLibrary.org. So thank you everyone once again. Thank you, John Kilbride, so much for joining us tonight. It was very thank fascinating. You. And I hope to see all of you again next time on Zoom. So have a wonderful evening. Norm, take care. You too. <laughs> yep, we'll see you. Kim, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.